Plato uh, con conceived his ideal republic. Uh, and you all know that uh, the, the debate about you know, whether poets should be given a place in that republic or not, whether they should be banished, uh, that is more or less a uh, debate which uh, became of immense literary importance. Apart from Plato's uh, Republic, uh, there was St. Augustine's The City of God, uh, which also influenced writers in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance. Um, in the Renaissance itself, we have Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, which is also an imagined country or an imagined commonwealth. And later, of course, there are many utopian writings like uh, George Orwell, 1984, and other texts. So. Uh, some of these writings speak of uh, an ideal country, some of them speak of country which is uh, devoid of all virtues and therefore a model that should be avoided, uh, where there is a lot of oppression uh, and uh, misery. So uh, this uh, negative vision is called uh, dystopia. Uh, therefore, Utopia has uh, given rise to both the genres, we may say, uh, Utopian literature and dystopian literature. I suppose you have the general knowledge about Sir Thomas More, uh, that he was a fervent Roman Catholic and he had a dispute with uh, King Henry VIII who was his uh, childhood friend. The dispute originated because of uh, Henry's proposed uh, divorce with Catherine of Aragon. Uh, for this, Henry wanted more support. Uh, more uh, was made the Lord Chancellor by Henry, and therefore his support was uh, crucial. But as you all know the story, that Moore uh, refused to support him in this matter because he was a great believer in Roman Catholicism and in Roman Catholicism uh, divorce was not allowed. And therefore Henry uh, ordered uh, arrest of Sir Thomas More and he was put into the tower uh, and there he wrote a dialogue, uh, which is another important text, uh, which was written during a crisis. Moore died in 1535, and in 1935, that is exactly 400 years later, he was made a saint in the uh, Roman Catholic canon. But uh, before that, Moore was already called Saint Thomas More because of uh, his uh, virtuous uh, nature, his religious nature. <clears throat> now these details about uh, Moore's uh, political career, uh, all these uh, would suggest that being a statesman, uh, he was aware of the problems of a commonwealth, the problems of a nation. and. Uh, since it is difficult to reform a commonwealth, uh, therefore uh, it is an alternative to uh, imagine reforms. And through a text, suggest reforms. <clears throat> now, Utopia is a fictional text. And uh, Moore uh, takes a lot of care to assert the uh, truth of the text, <clears throat> which was a convention uh, in literature beginning from the Renaissance up to the 18th century novels 
the writer would assert that uh, he or she is describing the true story of something. That what the the novel is describing is not false, but an account of a true experience. <clears throat> so this was a kind of a literary convention, and uh, paradoxically, uh, the assertion by the writer at the beginning of the text that it is a true experience, uh, just because the writer is following this convention, so it helps assert the fictionality of the text. That is, uh, nobody would assert such forcefully or with so many arguments that it is a true experience unless it is fiction. So you see that this contrivance or this device or this convention is a way of uh, marking the uh, importance of fiction as, as an area of experience in our lives. In our lives we must accept reality as well as fiction and uh, fiction plays no less a role in shaping our lives, in forming our lives, and they enrich our life experience in various ways. <clears throat> so you see here, you know, what I am yet to say is that all these political features or uh, details about most area in this description, I have yet left out one thing, the most important thing. That is, he was a humanist. So, what did it mean to be a humanist in the Renaissance? Or, what was Renaissance humanism? So perhaps you know that uh, the Renaissance humanists, they wanted a reform in the educational system of the country. They focused on school education, education at primary, secondary levels, and they mainly opposed the existent educational system which came down from the Middle Ages. And this existing system that has a name it is called the scholastic system of education. Scholasticism. I will write it here. So it appears that in some way humanism was opposed to scholasticism or in many ways it was opposed to scholasticism. Uh, the word scholasticism came from the word school. Uh, the medieval centers of learning they were known as schools. So the humanists opposed the kind of learning that that was practiced in the school. Mostly the schools were uh, monastic, that is run by monks, and the education they imparted was mostly um, religious. The, the humanists introduced secular education, that is what today we called literature. The word humanities comes from litera humaniores, that is human letters in Latin. Human letters. Letters here stand for literature. So literature that is human or that makes one more human, that uh, concerns mankind <clears throat> or that depicts mankind, where is such literature to be found? Uh, basically for uh, the Renaissance humanists, uh, it is to be found in classical literature, that is Greek and Roman literature. So apart from uh, Greek and Roman, there was also uh, Hebrew or other classical uh, literatures. 
but the Greek and Roman literatures uh, influenced the West much more because of uh, their accessibility. Uh, there was, of course, a barrier of language, and and since Latin was the uh, lingua franca of scholars throughout the Middle Ages, so Latin was much more uh, learned, read much more accessible than Greek. And even though Renaissance humanists started learning and uh, practicing Greek, particularly after the fall of uh, Constantinople, uh, the Greek scholars came to uh, Italy and other European uh, cities and started disseminating Greek uh, learning and culture. But um, Greek, Greek learning was not so uh, accessible, uh, particularly in England, and uh, <coughs> the uh, people who could read and write Greek were always very few in number. Thomas More was one of them. Well, so. I was uh, telling you about uh, humanism. So uh, the humanists were interested in education and they suggested reform of the scholastic uh, system of education. Uh, and Sir Thomas More, his friend Erasmus, uh, they were all uh, humanists in this sense. We find that in Utopia, uh, More uses a lot of Greek uh, uh, notions uh, or uh, words or ideas and uh, the principal character in this uh, book, uh, Raphael Hithlode or Hithlodeus, uh, the Latinate form, uh, his name is a combination of Hebrew and Greek. Hithlodeus uh, is a combination of Hebrew and Greek, and uh, it means the purveyor of nonsense. So you may imagine that uh, those who will understand the meaning of Raphael's name, Hitlerodeus, uh, and the principal uh, narration uh, in this novel is that by Raphael. So Raphael is a traveler uh, who uh, more represents as a, as a person who traveled with Amerigo Vespucci, and uh, then uh, at some point he uh, traveled on his own <coughs> and reached the country of Utopia, and uh, which is an island, and then he tells uh, Thomas More and Peter Giles uh, the story of his uh, adventure in Utopia which later the character Thomas More writes and writes as a book and sends it to his friends uh, to read. We have uh, Raphael Hitrodeus as the traveler. Uh, now you know the importance of travel in uh, the early modern period because it was a period when uh, the entire map of the world was not yet perfectly drawn and people were still sometimes discovering new words and as you know that uh, the discovery of America uh, added to the map and uh, the these new countries discovered they were called the new world. So it was an age of exploration, discovery and therefore uh, a lot of travel literature was naturally written in this period. And as some of the writers of the travel literature, they uh, wrote uh, as far as possible being faithful to their experience, many writers uh, wrote uh, about fictitious uh, things or uh, races, species uh, seen in different countries, uh, monsters, sometimes and so on, uh, which was part and parcel of travel literature. 
and uh, the story narrated by a sailor was uh, always suspected to have to contain some falsehood these writers they were also following the uh, tradition that came down from the middle ages in the middle ages we have a book mandeville struggles uh, written by bernard mandeville and uh, in that book also we come to hear of many strange species uh, monsters antipodes and and you know imagination running riot about different kinds of species which could be cyclops the travel writers of the early modern period they were following this tradition more invents this character sir thomas more a character thomas more who is writing the book and uh, he uh, imagines that uh, some other people also heard this story from uh, his lord uh, like peter guys of antwerp and to give substance to this claim more creates a lot of what critics call paratext that is uh, subsidiary texts around the main text so here we have uh, letters written by peter giles written by the character more thomas more to peter giles then we have uh, peter giles writing to uh, jerome buslaid and another character in the netherlands then thomas more writing to peter giles again so these letters they talk about Uh, the meeting with Hithrodeus, the sailor, and more writing a book on this story, but uh, more, more or less followed. I mean, the character more, more or less followed the uh, story, the narration of Hithrodeus faithfully. However, by some strange means, he missed the reference to the actual sea on which this island was found, and. even peter giles in his letter writes that uh, when hithrode was telling about this uh, location of the island at that time somebody in the audience had a cough and because of that he could not properly hear the name of the sea so uh, there is this kind of you know, textual contrivance claims and counter claims uh, which uh, weaves a paradox around the main text Uh, the whole purpose is to uh, first to follow the convention uh, that uh, more is writing a fictional book utopia and by claiming that it is a true story more is following the convention uh, and by creating this paradox more is uh, giving this fiction a uh, kind of resemblance to reality that is more was not alone uh, in uh, not knowing the name of the sea on which this island was found but there are other witnesses who also somehow missed it and therefore more tells uh, peter giles that when next you meet uh, hithrode because he is very much alive and perhaps traveling so when next you meet him you ask him the detail about this location and then i will make necessary corrections in my text so uh, it offers the book offers a curious you know play the fiction reality uh, uh, paradigm and uh, makes this work a very interesting one the book is divided into uh, two there are two books uh, more wrote the book utopia in latin and we are more or less following the translation by ralph robinson and this edition which i refer to you the wordsworth classics uh, edition that contains uh, robinson's letter dedicatory letter to master william cecil who was one of the principal secretaries to the king then the translator to the gentle reader that is also by ralph robinson so they are also added uh, to more text more was a consummate writer of latin and therefore uh, his utopia in latin uh, exhibits great latin style style was very important in latin writing 
and there were competing styles like Thessalonian style, Seneca style, uh, and uh, there were great masters apart from Cicero and Seneca. Uh, there were other great masters of Latin prose. So uh, an author who would write Latin prose uh, would have a great number of models or examples. <clears throat> and as you know that the that in the Renaissance uh, we also see the rise of the vernacular languages, uh, which means that not only is the language perfected, uh, but it imitates the classical language, uh, particularly Latin. And uh, therefore, those who write in English in the Renaissance, or those who translate from Latin into English, they always come up with some apology because they feel that the medium of their writing, the language, uh, English or French or whichever vernacular language, that language is not up to the mark uh, because Latin has been perfected over many centuries. And uh, the humanists particularly uh, practiced Latin writing uh, and, and attached a lot of importance to Latin writing. Uh, as a result of their uh, practice, there we have, for example, the uh, Ciceronian movement, that is the attempt to imitate Ciceronian style. Then we have a whole uh, wealth of newly created literature in Latin, which is called Neo-Latin literature. And this literature was written uh, in the 16th uh, century, uh, and scientists or philosophers continued to write particularly scholarly works as late as the 18th century in Latin. Therefore, we may imagine that Ralph Robinson would be a little apologetic that he is translating most Latin into English. The uh, book Utopia is divided into two parts or two books. The Incidentally, the second book which talks about Utopia, the state of Utopia and uh, their strange practices in, in that country. That book was written first. And the first book, uh, which is more about, which is more like a dialogue and debate over uh, reform in a national, in a commonwealth, in a country, uh, reform of the judicial system, the application of justice, punishment, and so on and so forth that is administration and so on. So the, the first book, it was written later. But when we read today, Utopia, we read the book which was written later, we read it first. And then we go to the second book which actually tells us about Europe, Utopia. So we uh, get a kind of a different experience from reading this book than what uh, more originally imagined. Right. So we begin the text. We begin um, from the chapter, <coughs> or we may begin even a little earlier. That is, the title of the book. There is a subtitle, or uh, there is a description, we may say, of the book uh, before the first book begins. The first book of the communication of Raphael Hitler Day concerning the best state of a commonwealth. So. Uh, the uh, meaning of this uh, title would change uh, if we understand the etymological meaning of Hithro Day. Uh, Hithro Day, as I already told you, uh, means a purveyor of nonsense, which means that Moore expects his reader to read this book uh, with some doubt in his mind with some skepticism. Uh, and uh, this uh, name of Raphael Hitler Day, it altogether, uh, you know, refutes the, the notion that whatever is claimed in this book is right. On the other hand, uh, it points to the very fictionality of the book. So, uh, we'll first see how uh, Peter Giles introduces Raphael Hitler Day to uh, Thomas More, the character, and uh, the 
first interesting discussion here is uh, Moore's argument for public service. Moore tells Raphael that uh, since you have such a uh, such an experience, you have seen so many countries uh, and you have seen the practices of people of other countries. Uh, therefore, it would be uh, wonderful if you accepted the position of a courtier and you advise the king on state matters. That is, if you entered into public service. Now, uh, Raphael rejects this proposal and kind of explains why he does not want to join public service. Now, why is this uh, debate or this argument important? Because uh, Moore himself, at one point of time uh, in his youth, before joining uh, the court, uh, was debating whether he should join public service or whether he should join a monastery and become a monk. That is, uh, whether he should reject worldly uh, practices. So there are both pros and cons uh, about this. And uh, we know that Moore uh, did not join the monastery, even though for some time uh, he uh, stayed in a monastery outside London and uh, throughout, these, throughout his life he practiced some ascetic rituals, but he did not join the monastery and he uh, became a successful courtier and the Lord Chancellor of England. But uh, the argument that it is not always advisable to join the public service, uh, I suppose, uh, was important enough for him to introduce this argument in this book. So when uh, uh, Moore and Peter insist that Raphael should join a public service, then he says, I am on page 28, to a wealthier condition, quote Raphael, by that means that my mind standeth clean against. Now I live at liberty after my own mind and pleasure, which I think very few of these great states and peers of realms can say. Yeah, and there be enough of them that sue for great men's friendships, and therefore think it no great hurt if they have not me, nor fewer for such other as I am. So uh, his argument is that I am free and I am happy. I, I, I live at liberty and at my own pleasure. That is, I do not have any master, I do not serve anybody, and I do what I want to do, so I am happy. But a wealthier condition, that is, if one joined a public service, then one would become richer, one would become more wealthy, which Raphael does not want to be. So, uh, in Raphael, we, we see... Uh, an argument, if not of complete asceticism, but of a rejection of the worldly ways of life can be found. This debate is also uh, related, we may say, or perhaps descends from the uh, Renaissance ideals of Vita Activa and Vita Contemplativa. Vita Activa means active life and Vita Contemplativa means contemplative life or life of meditation. Now it is believed in the Renaissance that an ideal courtier should be able to blend the two. It is active life and contemplative life. He should be able to take part in action, in warfare, but he should also have a contemplative mind and he should also be able to withdraw from action and uh, contemplate or meditate. Uh, sometimes that might be with a spiritual intention, 
or sometimes that might be uh, intellectual, but withdrawal and contemplation should also be part of a courtier's life. We find uh, this great Renaissance ideal of a combination of these two aspects of life uh, represented in Castiglione's book, The Book of the Courtier, Baldassare Castiglione, the famous uh, Italian writer, The Book of the Courtier, which was a book in the tradition of, uh, you know, uh, manuals about how to be a good courtier or how to be a gentleman or how to be a prince. Now, uh, in this tradition also comes Machiavelli is the prince, uh, that is a code of conduct for a prince, how should the prince behave. Uh, Castiglione writes about uh, the uh, uh, concept of the courtier, uh, how should a courtier behave, uh, what should be his learning, what should be his training, uh, what virtues he should have. And uh, this book by Castiglione was translated in the Renaissance itself by Sir Thomas Hobie into English, uh, the book of the courtier. Now, Hobie in that book uh, presents the idea uh, of the Renaissance courtier in a much more homely version, uh, making the courtier a gentleman, uh, the English idea of a gentleman, which is uh, slightly different from an Italian courtier, for example. Uh, I have an essay on this. Now, uh, in Castiglione's book, the last book of the book of the courtier, uh, there is a, a dialogue by Pietro Bembo, one of the characters. Uh, I do not know whether you heard the name of Pietro Bembo. Uh, he was a great writer, a poet, uh, and he also was a cardinal. Uh, he has great influence on uh, Italian literature of his time. Now, in this dialogue, Bembo speaks about uh, Platonic love. And uh, what we understand by Platonic love uh, was is different from what uh, the Renaissance understood. So, uh, in the Platonic and Neoplatonic philosophy, philosophical traditions, uh, love would unite a soul to God. And therefore, uh, Bembo suggests that a courtier should be able to contemplate and should be spiritually adept also, so that for him, uh, highest attainment through contemplation is possible. So Bembo uh, uh, gives us an example through this dialogue, I mean, uh, in Castiglione's book. Uh, Bembo suggests that a courtier uh, should, be able, should be able to attain the highest uh, uh, level of spirituality through meditation. Now, uh, why should Bembo at all think of uh, the highest level of spirituality? Uh, for that, one has to know uh, the neo neoplatonic uh, idea of the chain of being, the great chain of being. And that is, the world is uh, hierarchically uh, designed where there is a kind of uh, chain of beings uh, at the top, top of this chain or at the top of the ladder is God, below God the angels, below angels man, below man animals, then uh, vegetation, then minerals, rocks and so on, in an inanimate object. So, one could uh, transcend one's uh, level uh, by spiritual practice or by meditation and ultimately reach the top and unite with God. That was the Neoplatonic notion. And uh, the character Pietro Bembo in Castiglione's book suggests that a courtier should be able to uh, practice this kind of spirituality. So,
So you may imagine how uh, or to what high level Castiglione raised the idea of a courtyard and how much importance he gave to the notion of contemplative life. And in the Renaissance we see uh, uh, characters, uh, authors like uh, Michel de Montaigne who had an active life in, in his hometown, Bordeaux. Uh, most of the uh, writers also like Sir Thomas More, he uh, was a Lord Chancellor, the Lord Chancellor of England. So they all had very active life, but they also simultaneously lived an inner life, a spiritual life, uh, where they attached great importance to contemplation, meditation, philosophy and so on. Therefore, um, <clears throat> more raises this argument uh, in this book uh, because it was an important uh, debate, an important dialogue or an important, uh, we, we may say, conflict in his mind over uh, active life vis-a-vis -vis contemplative life. So King Henry VIII uh, persuaded him to join active life and he joined that life. But we you know the consequences of more joining uh, the active life as a courtier. Ultimately he was imprisoned and executed. Now, why was he imprisoned and executed? Why was he so adamant about his uh, faith in Roman Catholicism? and uh, about not allowing practices like divorce, which were not allowed by Roman Catholicism. Why he was more so adamant? Because he believed in faith. He believed in this inner life. He believed in this spirituality. So at some point, his inner life of spirituality came into conflict with the outer life of a courtier. That is the compromises that he needed to make in order to make Henry happy. He refused to make those compromises. So even though in the Renaissance we find that the, there is an ideal <coughs> combination of the uh, notions of active life and contemplative life, we find this ideal combination in literature. We find it in Cicero, we find it in Castiglione. But our world is imperfect. Therefore, in the real world, that combination uh, creates, sometimes creates crucial conflict, as it did in the case of Moore, and, and he had to die. All right. So, uh, we look at this argument by Raphael from this perspective. So Raphael rejects the uh, idea of being wealthier uh, and he uh, emphasizes the idea of being free and happy in his own way. And then he says that uh, there are always people available who want great positions in the court and therefore why should anybody bother about people like me? Like one or two people uh, who uh, do not want to accept this life. Because there is always such a great rush for accepting such positions uh, in the hierarchy, uh, in, the, in the corridors of power. <clears throat> Moore tries to argue with Raphael and says uh, that if you serve a king, then you can serve the people, because from the king a lot of benefits uh, accrue to the people. For from the prince, uh, as from a perpetual wellspring, cometh among the people <clears throat> the flood of all that is good or evil. Notice, good or evil. So that damages most argument in itself, which is a fractured argument. Because the prince can be a source of good, but he can also be a source of evil. So in that case, why should somebody want to follow the prince? <clears throat> but <clears throat> in you is so perfect learning that without any experience, and again so great experience that without any learning, 
you may well be any king's counsellor. Raphael could be seen either as a man of great experience without any learning or as a man of great learning without any experience, that is, experience as a courtier in the court. Uh, very wittily uh, juxtaposed together uh, the two ideas as if they are contradictory, that is, learning and experience. But we know that uh, Raphael had a lot of learning uh, because uh, he went to Utopia with the uh, best uh, books of Greek and other classical literatures and uh, taught the Utopians Greek, Latin and these, uh, these literatures. And uh, he is also the source of you know, most Greek ideas coming into this book. Uh, as the utopian alphabet which Moore gives at the end of the book, uh, which you also have in this edition. This alphabet, Moore says, was derived from Greek uh, by Raphael. So Raphael was no ordinary person without learning. He was uh, very erudite. At the same time, he was a sailor, uh, which means that he was naturally exposed to a lot of experience which other people uh, cannot imagine. Therefore, he had both experience and learning, uh, but here more uh, puts it in a witty way, uh, making the reader imagine that there is some contradiction between learning and experience, that if somebody is learned, he may not have the worldly experience, or if one is uh, worldly wise, then he may not have learning, but that is a false contradiction. Uh, as we see in the character of Raphael Hithrodeus. But then Raphael Hithrodeus is uh, the essence, we may say, of Renaissance humanism. That is, a person who combines in his uh, life experience and uh, learning. But then the character more is talking about not just any experience, but the experience of the court. And that is something Raphael did not have and he did not want to have either. Because uh, here uh, we find another uh, contradiction or uh, another conflicting notion uh, traditionally uh, represented in Renaissance literature, that there is a con conflict between the court and the country, that uh, the court is a place of corruption and the country or, uh, in the midst of nature there is no corruption. So when uh, Moore says this then Raphael replies, you be twice deceived Master Moore, first in me and again in the thing itself. For neither is in me the ability that you force upon me, and if it were never so much, yet in disquieting mine own quietness, I should nothing farther the will public. He says that you imagine that I have a lot of qualities or virtues of a courtier, but I do not have those virtues. So you are deceived in me. For first of all, the most part of all princes have more delight in warlike matters and feats of chivalry the knowledge whereof I neither have nor desire, than in the good feats of peace. So, princes uh, always prefer war over peace, and they want to conquer new countries, new provinces, and uh, for that they want uh, the uh, advice of courtiers who can uh, tell him about the uh, ways, uh, mat, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, many more, the way by which many more countries can be conquered or uh, the, the empire can be expanded and so on. And for that Raphael does not have any test. So he says that I uh, do not want to learn all those things. I have no interest in that. And the princes, they have no interest in feats of peace. It is maintaining peace in the country and then uh, how to benefit the people, uh, the kings, they are not interested in that. They are interested more in war. 
for the sake of glory or power or wealth. Uh, Rafael says that when somebody asks that why should one uh, carry on such activities like war and so on, then the common answer is that because our ancestors did. So Rafael says that people do not want to break the tradition. And Rafael, on the other hand, wants to question every tradition and thinks that just because our ancestors uh, did not do the right thing or did not, uh, did not uh, work out what was proper, what was right and what was wrong, that does not mean that we should always follow in their footsteps. And then he uh, goes on to say that uh, the judgment of kings, therefore, or the judgment of rulers, therefore, are often uh, unacceptable, wrong, wayward. And he says that once I had such an experience in England. And then, of course, Moore is uh, extremely interested to know uh, about Raphael's experience in England. And then as Raphael uh, brings up the argument of uh, the uh, capital punishment given to thieves in England. Uh, the thieves were hanged. Uh, and how this was uh, extremely cruel and unjust. So that uh, provides more an opportunity of uh, presenting a critique of the uh, law and the uh, legal practices in England which was, of course, a dangerous uh, thing to do. Uh, living in England and at the same time criticizing the law uh, and criticizing the legal practices uh, when the king him himself uh, was the friend of the author, so, uh, who is definitely uh, bound to read the book. And therefore, it was a very dangerous uh, thing to do, but uh, more always did dangerous things. So uh, through Rafael Heathrow Day, uh, he provided a criticism of the contemporary uh, legal loopholes or the evils of the uh, legal and judicial system in England. <clears throat> and uh, the second book, uh, which is the description of Utopia, now that book again is uh, nothing else but a criticism of the British ways of life or the British systems, systems and uh, suggesting alternatives uh, through the utopian systems. So both the first book and the second book uh, are they are written to provide a critique of contemporary practices in England. But uh, more presents this criticism through fictionality. And uh, so if he is pursued or if he is pressed, then he can always say that, well, it is fiction. And uh, he can further, he, he, he had uh, this uh, escape route uh, because here he writes in the initial letters that uh, whatever he has written, if it is found to be wrong, then he cannot be held responsible because it was a narration of Raphael Hitlode which he only slavishly uh, represented. And that is why uh, fictionality is so important uh, at the outset of this book or in the, in the uh, paratext offered uh, because Moore is uh, doing some real uh, harsh uh, critique of contemporary practices through this book. So Raphael says on page uh, 29, many times have I chanced upon such proud, lewd, overthrowed and wayward judgments, yeah, and once in England. I pray you, sir, quoth I, have you been in our country? Yes, forsooth. And there I tarried for the space of four or five months together, not long after the insurrection that the Western Englishmen made against the king which by their own miserable and pitiful slaughter was suppressed and ended. Referring to the Welsh rebellion and uh, how it was suppressed uh, 
in a, in a ruthless manner. Then uh, there is, uh, we find that uh, Moore introduces uh, through Raphael the character uh, Cardinal John Morton, uh, who was uh, the Lord Chancellor before Moore and uh, Moore uh, stayed with uh, Morton for two years and uh, he had great admiration and respect for Morton and Morton also loved him. So we find in this book he uh, pays his respect to John Morton by presenting him as a character. In the mean season I was much bound and beholden to the right reverend father John Morton, Archbishop and Cardinal of Canterbury, and at that time also Lord Chancellor of England. A man, Master Peter, uh, for Master more knoweth already that I will say, uh, not more honorable for his authority than for his prudence and virtue. This man is described. Uh, <clears throat> he was of a mean stature, and though stricken in age, yet bore he his body upright. <coughs> Morton. In his face did shine such an amiable reverence as was pleasant to behold, gentle in communication, yet earnest and sage. He had great delight many times with rough speech to his suitors, to prove but without harm what prompt wit and what bold spirit were in every man. In the which, as in a vain much, uh, as in a virtue much agreeing with his nature, so that therewith were joined or not joined impudence he took great delectation. So he is uh, represented as a man uh, of great virtue and at the same and the same person as, as apt and meek to have an administration in the will public he did lovingly embrace. In his speech he was fine, eloquent and pithy. In the law he had profound knowledge, in wit he was incomparable and in memory wonderful excellent. These qualities which in him were by nature singular uh, he, he, uh, he by learning and use had made perfect and the king also trusted this man. Uh, so John Morton who was the Lord Chancellor, he is described by the character more as a man of great virtue. And Raphael says that once I was in his house, in, uh, the house, in the house of Cardinal Morton and uh, then there was a discussion and this, uh, there was a lawyer and therefore there was a discussion about the laws of the country. So this lawyer, he was praising the straight and rigorous justice which at the time was there executed upon felons who as he said were for the most part twenty hanged together upon one gallow. So felons or thieves were hanged together twenty at a time and this lawyer was praising the uh, judicial system of England and Raphael objected to it. Nay sir, quoth I, marvel nothing hereat, for this punishment of thieves passes the limits of justice and is also very hurtful to the will public. So he said that uh, this is too cruel and uh, it is an injustice to, to them because their crime is not so great. For simple theft is not so great an offense that it ought to be punished with death. So we see that uh, this discussion is about uh, stealing, about uh, thieves, uh, about this petty crime of stealing. But Raphael uh, explains why first of all people become thieves and he gives many examples uh, who indulge in such crime like uh, soldiers who are returned from war uh, they are either lamed or handicapped and they cannot work properly uh, so they become thieves and criminals and uh, he says that the state should ensure that people have recourse to the basic needs of life, like food and shelter, so that they do not have to 
paper goes to stealing. So instead of punishing uh, the thieves uh, by capital punishment, they should rather be given opportunities for work so that the crime may be preempted. So he goes on to say, First, there is a great number of gentlemen which cannot be content to live idle themselves, like drones of that which others have labored for their parents. To the idle gentlemen, uh, they are also uh, potential criminals. How? Because uh, these are employed by rich nobles or lords. Uh, and these gentlemen, they do not have any work apart from being companions to the noble. So they are not skilled in anything. And uh, they uh, live the lives of uh, parasites benefiting from the hard labor of other people. Now in case this uh, nobleman who employs them sometimes uh, goes bankrupt or may die or whatever, when this support is not there, then these noblemen, they find them themselves without a job. And since they do not have any skills apart from rioting, so they, they uh, become criminals. And uh, that is another uh, aspect of society uh, that Raphael criticizes here. Their tenants, I mean, whom they pull and shape to the queen by raising their rents, for this only point of frugality do they use, men else through their lavish and prodigal spending, able to bring themselves to very beggary. So these idle gentlemen, uh, they sometimes raise the rent of their uh, land, which they give to others for cultivation. And they also spend their money uh, in a very prodigal manner and end up sometimes being beggars themselves. These gentlemen, I say, do not only live in idleness themselves, but also carry about with them at their tails a great flock or train of idle and loitering serving men, which never learned any craft whereby to get their livings. These men, as soon as their master is dead or be sick themselves, be incontinent thrust out of doors. So these serving men or companions of the Lord, they are thrown out of the doors when the Lord dies or is sick or whatever, or if they are sick. For gentlemen had rather keep idle persons than sick men, and many times the dead man's heir is not able to maintain so great a house and keep so many serving men as his father did. So when the son inherits the uh, property from a noble man, then he will not keep in his employment all the serving men of his father. So they will be uh, thrown out and uh, they will be on the street. So uh, that is one source uh, from which uh, petty thieves or criminals are made. Then another uh, source would be hired soldiers. Next page, page 32. Pursuit, sir, as well you might say, that for what sake you must cherish thieves. For surely you shall never lack thieves while you have them. So there is very little difference between soldiers and thieves. No, uh, nor thieves be not the most false and faint-hearted soldiers, nor soldiers be not the cowardliest thieves. So well these two crafts agree together. So uh, thieves can be false-hearted soldiers or soldiers can be cowardly thieves. But this fault, though it be much used among you, yet it is not peculiar to you only, but common also almost to all nations. So this is not a criticism only of England, but Raphael says, in all European nations, uh, these soldiers or mercenaries who are employed, hired soldiers, mercenaries, uh, they are little better than thieves and rascals. The whole realm is filled and besieged with hired soldiers in peacetime, which be brought in under the same color and pretense that have persuaded you to keep these idle serving men. For these wise fools and very arch 
to the whole wealth of the whole country herein to consist, if there are ever in a readiness a strong and a sure garrison, especially of old practice soldiers, for they put no trust at all in men unexercised. And therefore they must be forced to seek for war. So how to keep these uh, hired soldiers occupied? Because when they are idle, then they take recourse to all kinds of crimes. And uh, therefore to keep them occupied, the lords or the princes, they always look for war, so that the soldiers do not create a lot of disturbance. Then uh, having uh, spoken about these soldiers, uh, hired soldiers who uh, create a lot of disturbance, not only in England but in most countries, European countries, uh, Raphael uh, goes on to speak of something which is particularly English. Uh, a problem uh, which gives rise to uh, the practice of stealing and uh, petty crime. And uh, this English uh, feature is that of enclosures. So here Raphael or through Raphael Moore is alluding to an unjust practice by the noblemen of England, the practice of enclosing the commons. So in uh, England, you know perhaps that uh, there are always in every town or every city there are uh, areas which are meant for uh, the consumption or use by the public, uh, which do not belong to any particular individual. And these are called commons. Now, uh, in the 16th century, this practice of enclosure began uh, when the uh, landlords or noblemen who as such had uh, plenty of land, uh, they wanted to uh, raise their income by having more sheep. And having more sheep means you need more pasture land. And therefore, they started enclosing the commons by putting fence around them. And sometimes they also, you know, uh, sometimes these commons were also cultivated by petty farmers. But when these uh, lands uh, were encroached upon and uh, enclosed by putting fence around them, then these petty farmers lost their livelihood because they had no land for agriculture. Uh, all land was enclosed for pasture. So this led to the rise of the income among the uh, rich, but the poor men became poorer. And having lost their livelihood, many of them became beggars. So we know in the 16th century, uh, there is this <coughs> phenomenon of what is called sturdy beggars. That is men who had uh, uh, health, uh, who were strong, who could work, but they did not have any employment or any opportunity. And therefore they either begged or they roamed from place to place and therefore they were vagabonds. Now, uh, we have, for example, in Shakespeare's King Lear, an example uh, of a vagabond in uh, The Bedlamite Beggar. Uh, Edgar, the younger son of Gloucester, he takes the guise of the Bedlamite Beggar. So this tardy beggar who uh, earned his living by uh, frightening people and people would give them arms, give them uh, money, so that they won't uh, frighten them there, so that they, they would leave quickly. Now, these beggars and vagabonds, they were looked upon as a threat to society, uh, particularly because uh, English society was extremely hierarchical and uh, uh, in the feudal system, uh, everybody was rooted in his native soil. 
So people were not usually allowed to travel uh, from their village to other places. Uh, for travel, one would have needed particular permissions. So uh, ordinarily, people won't travel and won't uh, roam from place to place. But these unemployed young men, we may say, or these vagabonds, they uh, did not uh, belong to any particular place and uh, for the sake of getting arms or whatever, they roamed from one place to another. And when the vagabonds were caught, they were punished uh, very severely. So there were separate laws uh, brought out against the poor and vagabonds. So Raphael talks about uh, this uh, system of enclosures. Forsooth, my lord, your sheep that were wont to be so meek and tame, so small eaters, now as I hear say, we become so great devourers, and so wild that they eat up and swallow down the very men themselves. The sheep are eating the men, in the sense that, since all land is taken for pasture, enclosed for pasture, so men have no livelihood left. Their lands uh, for cultivation are no longer accessible. So they would die of starvation. So Raphael says that the sheep are eating men. They consume, destroy and devour whole fields, houses and cities. For look in what parts of the realm that grow the finest and therefore dearest wool, they are noblemen and gentlemen, yeah, and certain abbots, holy men no doubt, not contenting themselves with the yearly revenues and profits that were wont to grow to their forefathers and predecessors of their lands, nor being content that they live in rest and pleasure, nothing profiting, they are much annoying the will public, leave no ground for tillage. So these aristocratic men, uh, some of them are also abbots or monks uh, who all come from the noble families. So they are not satisfied with the kind of earning that their predecessors had but they become ambitious, they would earn more and therefore they start enclosing all the grounds and they leave no ground for cultivation. They enclose all into pastures, they throw down houses, they pluck down towns and leave nothing standing but only the church to be made a sheep house. The church is made a sheep house. Uh, the uh, metaphor of uh, Christians as you know sheep and the priest as a shepherd, uh, that is a traditional metaphor. Uh, so when all people start behaving like sheep, then there is nothing left uh, because uh, the church becomes a sheep house. Uh, so people stop behaving like men and uh, the uh, rich men, they can oppress uh, people by enclosing in this fashion. So this uh, the question of enclosure is uh, dealt with in detail uh, in uh, Raphael's narration and uh, at the bottom of page 34 he says, And though the number of sheep increase ever so fast, yet the price falleth not one might, because there be so few sellers, for they be almost all come into a few rich men's hands, whom no need forces to sell before the list and they list not before they may sell as dear as they list. So the number of sheep increases, but their price does not decrease. Uh, why? Because the noblemen won't sell them until they get a very high price. Uh, which means that the few rich men who control the whole trade in wool, they raise the price of wool so much by not selling the sheep that poor men cannot purchase wool. So they suffer all the more because in this cold country wool is very common, uh, needed for common consumption. Now the same cause bringeth in like dearth of the other kinds of cattle, yeah, and that so much the more because that after farms pluck down and husbandry decayed, there is no man that passeth for the breeding of young store. So this 
uh, greed in the rich man that also leads to the uh, to the uh, destruction of the trade in cattle because uh, farms are destroyed, husbandry is decayed, and basically uh, people who traded in uh, husbandry or who raised cattle, uh, they cannot afford it anymore because all money uh, goes into the hands of these rich men. For these rich men bring not up the young ones of great cattle as they do lambs, uh, but first they buy them abroad very cheap and afterwards when they be fatted in their pastures, they sell them again exceeding dear. So the rich men, they do not raise the young of the cattle, like they raise the young of the lambs. So uh, they buy them cheap from abroad and sell them at a high price, which means that the uh, regular system of husbandry is uh, destroyed. Thus the unreasonable covetousness of a few hath turned that thing to the utter undoing of your island, in the which thing the chief felicity of your realm did consist. Pasture, uh, which was the chief source of happiness in England, felicity. Uh, that very pasture uh, has now become the uh, cause for destruction of all other trades and the misery of the people. Now to amend the matter, to this wretched beggary and miserable poverty is joined great wantonness, importunate superfluity uh, and excessive riot. Because uh, rich men, noblemen, they, they were already known for their uh, extravagance, superfluity. Uh, and when they had a lot of money, then they would also be riotous, which create a lot of disturbance. We uh, see, for example, in King Lear, uh, the daughters Goneril and Regan, they argue with old Lear, uh, who wants to keep hundred knights, that why should he keep the hundred knights, because uh, the knights do nothing else than rioting. So, because these men, they were always armed, and uh, they were reckless, desperate. So, at the slightest provocation, there would be a world, a fight, and rioting. Now, boards, queens, whores, harlots, trumpets, brothel houses, stools, and yet another stools, wine taverns, ale houses, and tipping houses with so many naughty, lewd, and unlawful games as dice, cards, tables, tennis, bowls, quarts, do not all these send the hunters of the haunters of them straight as stealing when their money is gone. So Raphael is talking about this uh, vicious cycle that is uh, enclosure leads to men uh, becoming more rich and being more rich, they uh, indulge in extravagance, uh, they start rioting, they go to the brothel houses, uh, to the prostitutes. So this whole uh, industry of prostitution uh, and uh, sell, selling of alcohol in the wine taverns, uh, ale houses, and the uh, playing of uh, these games like cards, dice, gambling, uh, all these further lead to the uh, development of crime and these people become more and more criminal uh, when they lose all their money in gambling. So Raphael's argument is that the uh, vice of enclosure uh, and the uh, anti <coughs> attitude of the uh, rich men that lead to further development of vices in society, and finally to crimes and stealing. Cast out these pernicious abominations, make a law that they which pluck down farms and towns of husbandry shall re-edify them, or else yield and up in, uprender the position thereof to such as will go to the cost of building them anew. So these people should somehow be made accountable and responsible for uh, rebuilding the systems that they have destroyed. Raphael said. 
Suffer not these rich men to buy up, or to engross and forestall, and with their monopoly to keep the market alone as pleases them. So here, uh, more uh, refers to another uh, evil practice, economical practice, the practice of monopoly. Now, in the 16th century, uh, monopoly in particular trades, uh, that is, trading in particular commodities, were granted by the king to uh, noblemen, to uh, influential men, and these men, uh, being owners of monopoly, that is, they did not have any competition because nobody else uh, was uh, permitted to trade in that commodity. So they would raise the price of the commodity very high, and this would lead to further misery of the people, and the people won't be able to uh, consume these goods. So they would turn to crime, to stealing, if they cannot buy bread or butter and, you know, the uh, ordinary uh, uh, everyday articles uh, for uh, sustenance, if they cannot buy them because of extreme high price and by the monopolists, then that will lead to crime. Suffer not these rich men to buy up or to engross and forestall. So, uh, the country should do something. Uh, in stopping the practice of monopoly. So here we see that Moore was uh, offering a very modern uh, perspective. This criticism of monopoly uh, was unthinkable uh, at that time. Uh, monopoly was a practice not only in England, in France, in uh, European countries. and. The traders, we all know that the East India Company or uh, French East India Company, uh, different companies, uh, <clears throat> the Levant Company, so they were given monopolies in trading in spices or in silk or in particular other uh, commodities, uh, which they uh, bought very cheap from uh, these Asian countries and sold them at a very high price in Europe or in England. So, monopoly was uh, a feature of the economy of most of the countries at that time. Only in modern times we, uh, we realized that monopoly should be uh, legally, uh, it should be made illegal uh, and uh, its practice should not be uh, continued. But in trade, there is always a tendency for uh, rich uh, businessmen to somehow avoid competition and uh, you know, create some kind of monopoly. Therefore, we may say that uh, Moore was aware of this economic evil and uh, gives expression to this uh, in this text. Doubtless, unless you find a remedy for those enormities, you shall in vain advance yourself of executing justice upon parents. Enormities, big problems, big uh, crimes. Uh, so these uh, crimes committed by the rich, first they must be controlled, they must be checked. Otherwise, Raphael says, you cannot check petty crime, like stealing. And by hanging the thieves, uh, you cannot stop uh, stealing. So, Raphael will further explain that uh, uh, when he will uh, talk about capital punishment, he will explain why, why uh, executing the thieves does not help uh, in stopping stealing. So, uh, the cardinal uh, well, uh, the lawyer, uh, having uh, listened to Raphael's uh, arguments, uh, he immediately proceeds to oppose him, uh, because the lawyer here stands for uh, the representative of the English law of the times. So, he uh, kind of uh, summarizes and uh, enumerates how he is going to oppose Raphael's argument. Uh, which is a reflection of the, uh, you know, 
practice of scholastic logicians to enumerate things 1, 2, 3, 4 and how they are going to counter these arguments. The lawyer began to make himself ready to answer. Indeed, sir, quoth he, you have said well being but a stranger and one that might rather hear something of these matters than have any exact or perfect knowledge of the same as I will incontinently uh, as I will incontinent by open proffer make manifest and plain. For first I will rehearse in order all that you have said. That is, first I will repeat what you said, then I will declare wherein you be deceived, through lack of knowledge in all our fashions, manners and customs, and last of all I will answer your arguments and confute them every one. First therefore I will begin where I promised, and then uh, cardinal model stops the lawyer by saying that if you were planning to discuss these things in such an elaborate fashion, then that means that you are going to talk for a long time and I am going to stop you. Hold your peace, quote the cardinal, for it appeareth that you will make no short answer, which makes such a beginning. Wherefore, at this time you shall not take the pains to make your answer, but keep it to you uh, to your next morning, uh, to your next meeting, which I will be right glad that it might be given tomorrow next, unless either you or Master Rafael have any honest left. So the cardinal does not stop the debate, but he says that now it is time to stop and therefore we may carry on uh, in the next meeting. And uh, then uh, he asks Raphael, uh, why does he uh, uh, think that capital punishment is not proper? Uh, to which Raphael will uh, suggest or give his reply. And uh, this takes up another interesting theme, the theme of capital punishment. And as we know that even today societies are arguing over this idea, whether uh, the uh, life sentence, execution, death sentence, whether death sentence should be continued or not. And on this, different societies, different countries uh, have different opinions and we have not yet been able to arrive at any conclusion. So we see that more touches a problem which was not only a problem of his times, but a problem almost for all times, because even today we uh, deal with this question. And uh, that, uh, you know, suggests that how more was uh, clear-sighted, how he could see the uh, basic problems of people, of mankind, uh, to which we honestly uh, need a solution. So, if we look at the uh, book Utopia as a discussion, say, on politics, that is, what should be the ideal state of commonwealth, of a commonwealth, then also it is a, a question which still remains unresolved democracy, capitalism, Marxism, uh, uh, communism, uh, various kinds of republicanism, various kinds of uh, political form, formation of states uh, have been tried, oligarchy, monarchy, and so on and so forth. So uh, this experimentation uh, continues. Uh, in course of human history, in course of human civilization. And we have not yet reached any uh, ideal solution. And uh, that, is why, that is what uh, makes this book uh, contemporary uh, or uh, relevant uh, even today. But as we can see that the book has so many aspects, so many angles from which we can look at this text, economic, political, uh, social, you know, the question of manners, question of behavior, 
legal, uh, you know, uh, there are varieties of Veda. We may say that uh, there are multiple dimensions of uh, human uh, society, human civilization, uh, many of which have been touched by this text uh, and have been debated, uh, which makes it a very rich text, a very interesting text and relevant for our times as well. Alright, so I will stop here today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me.